before you with an expectancy of something wonderful. How can we look at your holy word and not be amazed? How can we look at your holy word and not just say, wow, words can't express the depth of love that you show to us, the depth of love that you have shown us in your son, the depth of love you've shown us in your spirit. So Lord, we'd be remiss to try to study this on our own. Holy Spirit, we need you to be here. We need you to open the doors of our heart and plant this seed. And Father, we'll water it and we'll cultivate it, knowing that it is you that will give the increase. So we come here for increase this day, Lord. We want to increase in you and decrease in us. We ask that, Lord, that it would be so in Jesus' name. Amen. When we're taking this walk through 2 Corinthians, we're not studying the book itself, we're studying individual scriptures that can be re removed from its context and still be a foundational teaching for us. And yet sometimes these just happen to blend together. That's how the Holy Spirit works. This is how he inspired Paul to write this. The first page that we're looking at this morning is a scripture that all of you are familiar with, but I don't think we always think of it in the right sense. It simply says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Some people use that as an illustration that we're not even supposed to be in contact with unbelievers and we're supposed to separate ourselves from the things of this world. And this is not what this is saying at all. Jesus is saying here, through Paul, through the Spirit, to not to be unequally yoked together. Being yoked together, this is a note you just want to make, might want to make to yourself to understand this. To be yoked together... A yoke is something that binds two things together. In other words, he's saying don't be bound. Don't be bound to an unbeliever. Don't be yoked to an unbeliever. He's not talking about simple society. Because how else could we tell them the good news that they've been reconciled to God if, we don't, if we're not there in their midst? What this is saying is don't be unequally yoked. We know the first one that comes to mind here normally is marriage. And I know people many times have tried to marry a Christian partner only to find out they weren't Christian later. Sometimes it can be a hard choice. But in not being equal, unequally yoked, and, I'm, I'm, and you know, those of us who have gone through anything like this, uh, you can understand the problems that can come from it. But so often we deal with things that were done before our Christian walk and we, don't, uh, we can't change it and we don't want to change it, but God can change it and make it right. But it used to be when we talked about being unequally yoked in marriage, we used to talk about it being a difference by faith. And this is what I tell these young men in the prison. So many of these men have fiancés or girlfriends or some have wives, but the most seem to be just in a relationship. And I tell them, you know, if, if you marry unequally yoked, this is not only a difference in faith, but it's a difference in species. Let that sink in. Tell somebody that. You, you're marrying somebody that is not just outside your faith. You're going to marry somebody that is outside your species. They're not even what you are. They are what you used to be. They are part of that old past that all things are gone. And so we want them to think about that. We're different by species. Then also it goes on, Paul, or Paul says, for what fellowship? Where it says fellowship, that is believing believers bound together. What fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? When Paul says here, I, th I think of uh, for the words from 1 John because he says, For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship? 
You know, that was the expression for the church in the New Testament, in the, in the letters of so many of the writers, is that fellowship, you don't invite people to come to church. We're not inviting them to come to a building. We're not come, inviting them to come to a denomination. We're inviting them to come to a fellowship of believers who believe together, who worship together, who, who live together. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? John 1, 3 says, That which we have seen and heard, we... we, we can't ride my, read my own ride here. We declare to you that you may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. You can't be yoked to an unbeliever. You, let me say this different. You can't be yoked to unrighteousness and then think that you're going to have fellowship with the church. In fact, it's a shame, but the thought that was going through my mind reading this was when it says, what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness is how much lawlessness is trying to come into the body of Christ, trying to be approved by different churches. I was wondering the other day, and we did, it didn't really give him a lot of time to explain it, when Pope Francis, head of the Roman Catholic Church, made a statement about two weeks ago, and he said that the churches should allow the LBGTQ to, uh, community to come into the church because it's not a crime. But as Ravi Zacharias said, whatever, just because something is legal doesn't make it lawful. And the truth is, we want them to come in. One of the guys gave a testimony at the prison, and he said he felt like the Lord was telling him that sometimes we're just too hard on people from that community. And that, and that may be some truth in that, because we want them in church. We want to know that they're loved. We want them here. You know, we're, we're, not, we're not judging you by being here. Our, our, our part is to catch you. Jesus' job is to, is to clean the fish. We're just supposed to catch the fish. And Jesus will clean them. So we have to be careful with that. But if we think that we're just going to open ourselves to the world to grow the... We could grow the church very easily if we'd compromise with the world and say, it's okay, God understands. We could make God into the most loving, open-minded false God that there could be if we wanted to portray a God like that. 1 John 1, 6 also says, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the, the truth. And then in Philippians 4, 3, Paul says about his true companion, he calls, uh, he refers to his true companion, this one that's a friend of his, as his yoke fellow. So being yoked isn't wrong. It's just being yoked with the wrong people. Now, I just want you to understand that this is talking about something bigger than just, again, a social relationship. When you're married, you're bound. If you, have a, if you go into business with an unbeliever, you're bound. You're bound to that unbeliever. This is what the Bible's talking about. Don't be bound to the unbeliever. But we can be bound. We're bound to each other in, in, in fellowship here. Nothing wrong with that. And then Jesus gives us an invitation. He says in Matthew chapter 11, verse, let me put my glasses on here. Verse 28, he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. He's saying he's inviting us to be yoked with him. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Come to me, all you labor and are heavy laden. In the Greek, that means that you labor to the point of exhaustion. I think he's talking about those that are always through their own works trying to build a relationship with God that can't be built. And Jesus says, no, just lean on me. Be yoked with me. My yoke is gentle. My burden is light, and you will find rest for your souls. But if you, it's just the opposite, though, if we yoke ourselves to the unbeliever. We're not going to have rest. We're not going to have peace. And so we want to remember that. Because so, always so specifically that is mentioned of marriage, but it's more than marriage. It's any kind of deep relationship in which we will bind ourselves to someone else, and we're just not going to do it. And Paul focuses more on this in our next verse here in 2 Corinthians 6.16. 6, he says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? 
He says, for you are the temple of the living God. I, I think it's interesting that he doesn't say, he's under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he doesn't say, for you are the temple of God. It says that other places, but here he says, for you are the temple of the living God. And I've got a point to make on that. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. I think this is one of the gravest failures of the Christian church that I think is, is happening in most people. I don't think we really give, and I'm talking about myself too, I don't know that we always give ourselves totally to this idea of being the temple of God. I think it's just kind of a nice religious nicety to say that, but it's, it's more than that. I mean, this is exactly what God wanted. God wanted, to, wanted us to be his temple, that he would be in this temple. And so again, when you look at the original Greek on this, again, as I've told you many times, there are two different words for the temple. There is the word heron, which is the surrounding courts, and then there is the word naos. In fact, I even saw a Bible last Sunday where one of the prisoners had, that actually says naos instead of referring it to temple. But most of our, our English translations will say temple. But where a Huron is the surrounding courts, the naos is the holy of holies, specifically for the holy of holies. So when Paul says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the living God? He's saying, don't you know that your body is the holy of holies? That's a tremendous statement. I always use that as the argument when people want to say, uh, when I tell them, you know, that you are as holy right now. If you've given your life to Christ, if Christ is your Lord and Savior, if you have had a born-again, a true born-again experience, um, you're as righteous, you are as holy as you're ever going to be. Your spirit has been made righteous by the entrance of Christ. And you see that th this uh, uh, is exactly what God wanted to do, to, to leave the temple in Jerusalem and come into the temple of individual believers. But there's a requirement for us to say. It's not just enough for us to say, I'm the temple of God. There's a requirement in that. There's a requirement of what, would be, what the temple does. The temple is a place where worship and offerings are given. How often do you worship in your temple? How, much, how many sacrifices do you bring to God in your temple? I have to ask myself the same thing. He went through a, he went through a lot of heartache and put his boy through a lot of hell. Excuse me, but that's exact truth. Through a lot of hell so that we could be the temple of the living God. So that he could what? Look at how Paul phrases this. Not only are you the temple of the living God, as God has said, he quotes him, he said, I will dwell in them. And that would be enough right there if it was just God dwelling in them, and I will walk among them. God walking around inside our temple. This is the place where God wants to be. And we always think about that's going to be in heaven, that God will walk in our midst and we'll walk with God. But we have that, that, that great blessing now that God walks in us. God walks through the temple. You are the temple. This is where God is. This is his holy place. This is where he sits. This is where he walks. This is where he examines what's going on. He says, I will be their God and, I, and they will be my, my people. And I will walk among them. Paul goes on then. He builds on this. In our next selection, with his second, which is 2 Corinthians 7, 1. He says, having these promises. What promises? That we are the temple of God and that God moves in us, walks through us because of that, that promise. Because it is real. He says, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness and fle of flesh and spirit, perfecting, which means completing, completing holiness in the fear of God. In other words, if we really believe that we are the temple, it's going to shape our conduct. It's going to, because we have to, you know, I remember, Ken, I'm sure you remember these times at McDonnell Douglas, whenever a tour would come through, these guys would all go crazy. Make sure every, every, everything that's out there is square with the aisle. They, you know, all the supervisors would come through and make sure that all, if there were any pallets in a given area, that all the pallets were, were straight and this and that. And they, they went through all these different things. You know, clean up your area. Don't put anything on your desk. It was, all, it was also for, it was Biden going down to the border. Don't let him see, don't let him see the junk. Put, you know, sweep it all aside. Sweep it under the carpet until the tour's done, you know. Well, God doesn't take a tour like that. God lives in us. And you have to wonder, what does God see as he tours around us? How, how are we cleansing up? We've got the best reason in the world to cleanse our, ourselves and cleanse this temple. You know, Jesus cleansed the temple. He expects us to cleanse the temple. 
Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. Take it serious. So often, you know, what, what we're allowing into our bodies, what we allow to come through the eye gate, what we allow to come through the ear gate, what we allow ourselves to see, what we allow ourselves to listen to, all determines the, the, the cleanliness of our temple. And so that's just that's a meditation right there. Just, just when you leave today, think about that. Marinate in that. God is not just in me. He walks among me, if you will. He will walk among us physically when we are in heaven. But He walks among us now. And that should be enough to make anyone just say, I'm going to, I'm going to be a temple guard. I'm going to guard the temple. I'm not going to allow anything that is unholy or unrighteous to come into that. And we, you know, we, we play that game because we don't believe it enough. This, this to me is so often for many Christians just a sideline little thing that we talk about that we're the temple of God. And we don't realize that this is what it's all about. As the temple of God, we submit ourselves to God as, our, as bond slaves and that we carry the, carry the Lord in us in our temple. If we really believe that, we would take much better care of the temple. And again, like I said, we wouldn't do a, a Biden tour. We wouldn't try to sweep things under the... We wouldn't come on Sunday morning and try to cleanse ourselves here and, or when we take communion in no other time. We would be aware that we have this precious promises that we would cleanse ourselves from all filthiness and flesh of the spirit and well, the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Then Paul makes another statement here that... I'm not really sure how you take it. I think each of us is going to have to look at this statement from our own perspective. At first I wasn't even going to include it because I thought, how do you translate this? I'll tell you what it means to me and you'll have to see whether you can agree or if it means something else to you. It's kind of an odd statement. He's not at the church at Corinth when he's writing this, of course. And he says to them, you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. To me, that's a special and precious promise. It's a promise that we as fellow believers with each other, we are truly brothers and sisters. This is a family. We live together, we die together. I take it that literal. I think, I know I'm old-fashioned, I'm an antique, and I know it. And I wish I could turn back the hands of time sometime. I'd like to see back in the old days when you went to a community church, you know, or you had a family of believers that went from generation to generation to generation, and you had the little cemetery outside in the backyard of the church, you know. You knew where you were going to end up. You knew where you were, where your, at least your body was going to lie while your spirit's in heaven. And I just miss, miss so much of that whole idea of family. That we are people who, we live together, we die together. Face it, we're all aging in this room now. There's no guarantees on anything. Not at all. But I think there's comfort in that. Even if you're a, a single person in the church, you're not alone. The Bible says God sets the solitary in families. I believe he does that. But so often churches become just busy. People coming, people going, and people come in and they have their 10 minutes of greeting and they go on. But we are part of, a, I believe, a people that love each other and are growing together. We live together, we die together. I'd open that up if anybody wants to comment on that in a different way. Or does it strike you the same way? And you could look at it as we. We die together and live together. We're all, you know. When those of us leave, when it's time for us to leave, we're still together. We always will be. These these relationships are eternal. As I always like to say when I'm asked to do a funeral, one thing I always like to point out is they always say you can't take anything with you, but what you take with you is the love. It is eternal. Our relationships are eternal. You and I will never be separated. They're eternal. We may change locations, but we're never going to be separated. 
And I find great comfort in that. And the Bible is, is well with that. We're not excluded to just only finding comfort from our, our God. We also find comfort from each other. In fact, talking about comfort, then we come to this next verse in 2 Corinthians 7. There's a mistype there. That is 2 Corinthians 7, not 2 Corinthians. I can't make out. I already scratched it out. But again, showing the reality of the situation. He says, when we came to Macedonia, we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Did that ever describe you? Describes me. I have those times where outside are conflicts and inside are fears. And we'd like to say, well, if our faith was just strong enough, we'd never feel that way. Well, I think Paul had pretty strong faith, and he felt that way. Sometimes there's just conflicts all around, and fear comes in. I've had to learn something, and I'm sure you have too, that it isn't that fear itself is wrong. It just says that completed or perfected love casts out fear. Fear itself is going to happen. We're only human. The Bible says we, God knows we are but dust. Even King David said, when I'm scared, I'll run to you. So if fear is not something that we should be ashamed of. The issue is, what do we do with it? How do we hand it off to God? How, how do we take his yoke upon us and find out that his yoke is easy and it's light and we'll find peace for our souls? Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Nevertheless, God. Those two words change everything. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us. There is a comfort in God that's hard to explain to people. You know, they, they think that we're so crazy about this Jesus thing. They don't understand our narrow-mindedness that Jesus is the only way to God. But I feel sorry for people who don't know the comfort of God. Who just think God is out there somewhere. Watching when he's right here. How close is God? He's walking in us. Touring his temple. We'll go to our next page. And these all pretty much link together. You can take them individually, but they, 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 they link together. And Paul takes a few moments to talk about the grace of giving. I'm not talking here about giving money, you know, tithing and stuff. In fact, probably to wrongly, in almost 40 years of off and on of being here, I've never once taught a teaching on tithing. I've always been, been so disgusted by the people who say, well, the only reason they want you in church is for your money, you know. That's why we've never taken up an offering. And I don't believe we've ever asked for money except to volunteer when we replaced the rug. And that's been almost now 20 years ago. But that doesn't change that there are truths to giving. Giving with a right attitude. So he starts this by saying in 2 Corinthians 8 9. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that you, through his poverty, might become rich. He says, you know the grace of God. You know the favor of God. That's how I translate grace. I know it's easy to translate grace as unmerited favor. You'll hear that a lot. But I don't like that because the Bible says Jesus grew in grace. And if you, if you use that, that firm a definition, then you're saying Jesus uh, grew up, grew in uh, undeserved grace. And every, Jesus deserved all the grace he had. So I don't look at it as undeserved favor, it's just simply favor. For we know the favor of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. There was a great Christmas hymn written based on that verse right there. He who was rich became poor for us and traded the throne room of heaven for a stable floor. I can't remember all the words to it, but it's a beautiful, beautiful hymn describing what we're reading right here. 
And Jesus said himself, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And it struck me as I was studying this that Jesus was never a hypocrite. He didn't tell any of his disciples to do anything that he didn't do or wouldn't do. Jesus is the one who said that the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. He was always provided for because he was not a hypocrite. He believed what he said, which is seek the kingdom of God first and all the, all, all the other things you need will be added unto you. We shouldn't be praying about the add-ons. Those should come anyway, just by our fact of our seeking the kingdom first in all things. Like Jesus. And I'm learning this. I'm learning to live one day at a time. And it's hard to do. We have these creative minds and we're always trying to think and plan and do this and do that. And to some degree, there's nothing wrong with that. But if that consumes us to the point, you know, we, we don't have a promise of tomorrow. We have today. And we don't know how much of today we have. But just to live each day as it comes and be thankful each day. I think if we did, we'd be more thankful. Instead, we're always planning in something. And when what we plan comes to pass, then we become thankful. When we should be simply thankful that we've had a good day today. God's on his throne. His mercy is forever. He loves us. We love each other. We've had a good day. We've had a real good day. To be rich in this life, when he says through his poverty we might become rich, there's nothing wrong with money. It's the love of money. But I don't even think he's talking about this. I think life has better things than that. Life is not described in the Bible in the English very well. The translation is from the word zoe, which means the very life of God. It's a quality of life, not a quantity of life. Neither does it measure riches. Besides, Jesus is the one who said it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. In my life, I've worked at different times with different contractors and stuff in the construction fields. And... They deal a lot with the owners, you know, of these properties, high-priced properties. I mean, we built an entertainment center for Bomarito that was $36,000 just for an entertainment center. It's just a place to put his TV. These people have money and things that most of us in this room don't understand. It's not our lifestyle. I'm not even sure I would want it to be because what these contractors would tell you is that they've never seen more people scared that they're going to lose their money than rich people. So much better to have life in Christ to be rich in wisdom, to be rich in family, to be rich in friends, to be rich in God. Then he goes on to say another statement about giving. He says, 2 Corinthians 8.15, he says, As it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left, nothing left over, and he who gathered, who gathered little had no lack. The Christian church, I'm sorry, the Corinthian church, had taken up a material collection of finances and probably some other things that were going to go to the poor saints in Macedonia. That's what Paul was talking about here. He's talking about that gift that they gave. So they were going to give this to the poor saints. And Paul encouraged this offering and uses it to bring a teaching on giving. He says this, and I think a lot of people miss this. I think I know a lot of churches miss it. I have been in churches where they wanted to go for building a new building and literally just beat people up about it. I mean, it just never stopped. I remember down at Troy when they were going to put up a new building and they were trying to get everybody to make a pledge. We were having a Sunday school picnic for the well over 100 people coming from the Sunday school that we were teaching there at Troy. And the pastor said, do you mind if I stop by? I said, well, no, you're always welcome to stop by. People will be glad to have you stop by. So often pastors get busy and they don't have time for some side things like this. And so the pastor came, set up a TV screen that he brought with him, set up a, a, a projector, and talked for over an hour on why they all should pledge when they've heard this every single Sunday. And then he comes to the picnic, and we really had no picnic. By that time, the sun had gone down. You know, people were disillusioned about what it was, and I just... And, I, you know, people might say, well, it's for a good cause. Yeah, but you don't have to be ignorant about it. And look at what Paul says here, because he really touches on this. 
he says, again, he appreciates that they've given this offering and he's going to make sure he gets to Macedonia. He says, for if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a man has and not according to what he does not have. So in other words, just in that first teaching, he's saying that when an offering is taken up, haven't you ever been in a church or visiting someplace or visiting another church with friends or relatives or whatever, and you forgot about the offering and they, they, want, to take, or they want to take a special offering up or maybe they've had a guest speaker and you had I, no idea. I'm sa- I guess what I'm saying is, have you ever been in a church where they wanted you to give money and you didn't have any money? I've been in that situation. It was kind of a surprise. It was, this wasn't expected. You know, I always like it when somebody says, so-and-so is going to speak at our church. It's a free will offering, you know, that, that we're going to take a free will offering. At least you've warned me what you're going to do. Otherwise, I would expect the church has brought this person in and was, you know, funding them to do this, whatever. So in other words, what he's saying here is if you're in that situation, it's a matter of, and you have this readiness that you want to give, but if you don't have it, don't worry about it. He's saying it's not a big deal. You can only give from what you have, not, not from what you lack. He says, for if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a man has, not according to what he does not have. For this is not for their e- this is for this is not for their ease and for your uh, and for your affliction. In other words, he's saying, I want you to understand something. He said, Yeah, we've got some poor saints in Macedonia that need help, but the uh, the, the 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 purpose and the objective is not to make you poor and make them rich. He's simply going to say this. I'll just. I'll just fold this up this way. What he's really saying here is that simply is right now the Corinthian church had supply. That's what the word Paul uses. You have supply. You've been blessed. You have material goods. God has been very good to you. You have more and more abundantly than you even need. And he says, and it was right of you to supply their need that they have now because their need in the future may become the supply to you. That's the way it is. We know that's the way it is. There's ups and downs in life. Nothing is ever totally consistent. Paul said, I've learned to be abased and abound. I I know how to be content in all things. But he's saying here is that we're not, you know, we're not trying to make you poor and make this poor church rich. What we're trying to do is balance it out. You've got a supply here. Give us some of your supply. In the future, it may be them that need to give some of their supply to you. So what he's talking about here is really the term equity, to keep it equal, to keep it equitable. And where he quotes from that, is from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is where he's quoting from uh, when God would bring the, uh, the manna, the bread, you know, the heavenly bread that would be on the dew in the morning, and they'd bring the, he'd bring the quail at night. So they had meat and they had bread, remember, for the children of Israel in the wilderness. And they went out. If they had a large family, you gathered a large amount. If you had a small family, you took a less amount. But it all equaled out in the end. Everybody had food. Everybody was happy. Everything was, it was equal. And this is all that Paul was trying to say here. He says, This is not for your ease or for their ease and for your affliction. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their, for their, uh, for their want that their abundance may also become a supply for your want. So together there, that may be equity as it is written, he who gathered had much and nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. It was equal. Everybody was fed. And that's really where the church was. You know, and there was no social system to protect people. This is why widows and orphans were so important in the New Testament times. There was no government agencies to take care of anybody. You know, I still remember what it is to get your check and find out a third of it had already gone to FICA for all the different programs and things that were there before even supporting anything in the church. The idea was always that when you had it, you gave it. And this was, this was, this was the, what, what was so wrong with... Uh, Oh, I'm going to get their names wrong. Zacharias and... Who's the two that fell dead at the apostles' feet? Him and his wife. Because they lied about what they're selling some property. You know what I'm talking about? Say it again. Ananias and Sapphira. Thank you. Ananias and Sapphira. It wasn't they did anything wrong. It was theirs. They even said, the money was yours to keep or to give. 
you know, but why did you, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit and say that we didn't sell whatever property or whatever material it was? Nobody was making you give anything. So just be honest about it, you know. And this is, this is actually what caused their death was to sin against the Holy Spirit, to lie against the Holy Spirit. But because the church was never one of taking your goods. It's what you bring. This is why we don't take up an offering. Where do you see in the Bible that we take an offering? It says people came and gave. That's why, you know, people might come here for some time and say, what, does this church ever take an offering? No, that's between you and God and send those baskets back there. And hopefully you, you, you are giving it with praise and prayer because that is an offering as you, you as a priest unto God from your temple to God's temple, if you will. Let's go on. I'd like to finish these three today. This next verse is one that I'm sure you've heard and it's just, just the truth. We always use the expression, you reap what you sow. That's about what Paul's saying here in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. He says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I can think of so many times in my life that God gives an opportunity to give. Um, I remember years ago, I was asked to go with a pastor to a pastor's conference in New Orleans, in Louisiana. We didn't have the money to go. It was going to cost about $100. Pardon me. And that week on the radio, we had heard about a man who had stopped to help a woman who had a flat on the highway. He was changing his tire, her tire far, and he was hit by a car and killed. And that really hit me, this good Samaritan that was trying to do good. And they had set up, way before we had fund me pages, but they were setting up a thing at a local bank to pay for the expenses of the man's funeral. And I told, told Susan, I said, we're going to sow $10, which for us at that time, $10 was $10. I said, but we were going to sow it into that. So we sowed to that man's funeral and for his family the $10. We got a check in the mail. I don't even remember who it was from, for $100 like the next week. I'm not making this up. We had everything we needed to go to the pastor's conference. And, all, and there's, there's, there's times like that. Uh, we don't invest in rat holes. I mean, you, you, the, the calls for money are always in a church situation. But um, we're not saying throw money away. We're saying make a sound investment as God, as God leads you, as God shows you to do. And, of course, it is true. What, what, if we sow sparingly, we reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Here's a note I want to give you. I, I'd like you to write this down if you would. It's a sentence, so I'll take it in short things here. But I think it says a lot. Your seed, your seed, then in parentheses you can put your offering, because that's what we're talking about, your offering. We're using the illustration of sowing seed, but we're talking about your offering. Your seed is a portrait of your trust in God. Your seed is a portrait of your trust in God. Next part. What leaves your hand, what leaves your hand, what, what's taken out of your hand, what leaves your hand. I'll start from the beginning. Your seed, your offering, is a portrait of your trust in God. What leaves your hand doesn't leave your life. What leaves your hand doesn't leave your life, but enters your future. But enters your future. I'll say that again. Your seed, your offering, is a portrait of your trust in God. What leaves your hand doesn't leave your life, but enters into your future. Bible talks about us casting our bread upon the waters. Bible talks about us blessing. And I know you are. You're a very blessing church. This church has blessed me over and over. And many of the times when I, when I, when I, I, so when I would say, there's no way that they're, we're going to get a Christmas gift or this or that. Not that we were looking for it. We just knew. You know, we'd struggle to get everything done and um, always just grateful for what we have. But you guys have blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. And, you know, we've come to find out if you... The older you get, the more you realize that God has people in place to bless you 
and he has you in place to bless somebody else. It just works that way. God blesses through people. It doesn't come any other way. It always comes through people, through somebody who does something that blesses us. So remember that as we, we give sparingly, we reap sparingly. If we sow bountifully, we reap bountifully. That's why it's stamped on our coins, and God we trust. Then these, this last one, or this next one, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. I've got a whole ton of notes here. It says, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. Nobody should make you give anything. You, and if you feel that way, you're wrong to give because well, nobody's asking you to give anything out of necessity, nor grudgingly. We need to be careful that, because it goes on to say, for God loves a cheerful giver. I thought what was interesting, where it says God loves a cheerful giver, make this note. The Greek word here is hilaros. H-I-L-A-R-O-S. 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 You don't have to look deep to figure out what English word that translates into. Hilarious. Give hilariously is what he's saying. Not just cheerful about it. Give hilariously. Because you understand what's all behind it. The blessings that are involved in it. Don't give grudgingly or out of necessity. In other words, if, if you can't give, and, and there are people that are, that are Scrooges. We know that. Uh, I don't know of any here by any means. But there are people. There are people who resent helping other people it's kind of like well if you if you hadn't done this or you hadn't done that I wouldn't have to be giving you out of my pocket you know there's an animosity towards the one you're trying to bless God says no uh, uh, uh. I don't count that I count I want to see hilarious giver I want to see a cheerful giver as you purpose in your heart and we have to remember God always looks at our hearts we should give without protest we should give without animosity to the one who needs help and then just this teaching that comes out of Second Chronicles 6, 7 through 9. I want you to understand, and I've shared this with you many times, but I want to keep sharing it with you. And that is that God is looking at the purposes of your heart. God reads the heart, not your lips. He knows, he knows what's behind the words. He knows what's down deep in your heart. And if you remember, David wanted to build the temple for God. David's walking through his palace one day and he looks out in the courtyard and there's the tent with, you know, that tent has been around for like 350 years. Probably got some wear and tear on it, you know, all the skins and all the other things that were part of this. And David, you know, it just hits David. He said, I'm walking in a palace and the God of Israel is in a tent. He said, Lord, I want to build you, uh, I want to build you a house. I want to build you a temple. But he couldn't do it because God told him there was too much blood on his hands. David was a warrior. But what he was able to do through his warfare that God sent him to was to defeat enemies and take their riches and bring them back to Jerusalem for the building of the temple. David may not have built the temple, but he supplied the supplies for the temple. And in 2 Chronicles 6, 7 through 9a, I'll read this to you. Solomon is speaking at the dedication. It says, Solomon said on the dedication of the temple, Now it was in the heart of my father David to build a temple. It was in his heart. To build a temple for the name of the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father, David, whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for me, for my name, you did well that it was in your, you did well that it was in your heart. God knows what we've done and God knows what we would have done had we had the permission or the resources. So I firmly believe this with all my heart. I don't know about you, but I, I know I can't repay God, and I don't think any of us believe that we can. But we try to do the best we can to, to show Him how much we appreciate. We worship because we appreciate what He did. You know, we love Him for what He does. We appreciate all those things. And I really believe that there are things that we would do. Every, every one of us has probably played the game. Well, what if I won that multi-million dollar lottery, which I don't play? Hard to win when you don't play. And I'm not knocking anybody that plays. I'm, I'm not making an issue out of it. All I'm saying is we've all played that game of, well, I'd give this child this and I'd give this child this and I'd do this and I'd do that, you know. And there are times where we think, my mom always used to say, if I had a million dollars, I'd give it away. 
And I know she wasn't just talking. That was her heart. She'd give it away. And my mom never had a million dollars. But I believe if she purposed in her heart to do something good with that, that's accounted to her. This is God saying to David, good that it was in your heart that you wanted to do it. It counts as your reward in heaven. It's added to your reward. There are things that we're going to get rewarded for that we never did, but simply wished in our heart that we could have. That's the good God that we serve. I'll honor that. I'll take that. Now, give what you can give, yes. But what you purpose in your heart, God sees it. You may never do it. Many of us will never have those kind of opportunities to do that. We will do what we can do. And what we can do is, is, is the best that we can do. But in our hearts, we can talk about things that we would have done. Is good, David, that it was in your heart that you wanted to build a temple for my name. So David, or, or really Solomon on that day of dedication was saying, everybody's calling this Solomon's temple, but it's really my dad's because he purposed this in his heart. Maybe there never would have been a Solomon's temple without David's heart that wanted to build it. The next one, one we're familiar with also, 2 Corinthians 9.8. It says, God is able to make all great... What I want you to notice in this verse is these words, all, always, uh, every. It's so inclusive. God is able to make all grace... He doesn't say God's able to make some grace or God's able to make grace. God is able to make all grace abound, increase toward you, that you always, all grace abound, always, having all sufficiency in all things. You may have an abundance for every good work. Wow. God is able to make all things, God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That you always, having sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in us both to will and to do for His good, His good pleasure. Ephesians 2.10. I don't think I understood this verse until late in life. Paul said, For we are His workmanship, created in Jesus created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I take that literally. Before the foundation of the world, because God has already completed everything, we know that. God, God works from the, from the end to back to the beginning. He says that God prepared these the, the good works that we will work in. The blessings that you're going to do, the good, wa- good works that you, you're going to walk in, the good things that you're going to do that's going to make men praise God are already in place by God. Sometimes I think it is, you know, we, we, and there's nothing wrong with us trying to search how we're going to bless or, or who we're going to bless. But if we would pray about it, we'd find out that God's already arranged all that. He'll bring it into our lives. He'll, he'll bring that divine appointment. He'll do what he has to do. He says all these things, that we, that these, we walk in these good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, that we should live in them. So as, as we worship in our temple and each morning as we rise, we ought to say, Father, and lead me to those who I can bless today. You've created the good works for me to walk in. Bring me to those good works so that men will glorify your name. You've already done it. Because you can, you, you, only God, you, you know, stupid old expression, but it's so true. We don't know what we don't know. If people don't tell you, you don't know. Unless God tells you, you don't know. God knows who needs what. God knows, you know, because a lot of times people will ask you for one thing, but really need something else. And they're trying to finagle their way around to get to it. The guy that wanted me to pray with him, so he'd sell his chainsaw so he could come up with 50 bucks. I said, let's just believe for the 50 bucks. You don't know what God's going to do. And let's close with our last verse here in 2 Corinthians 9.10. This is really a benediction. It's a prayer. It's a prayer for the church. That's what, a benediction is a, is a closing prayer. Paul says this to the church at Corinth. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower, who gives you the seed, 
and bread for food, the God who meets every need. Supply and multiply, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. It is always God who gives the increase. May he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. How can we almost not make it as Christians when God's doing everything for us? Is he not good? Does he, you know, there, there, I, I can't quote the verse in Scripture, but after Jesus sent the 70 out, at a later time he was talking to them and he reminds them, you know, because they're always kind of like, well, we need this or we need that. He said, when I sent you out with one pair of shoes and a bag, you know, I didn't send you with much of anything. I just sent you out. He said, did you lack anything? And you kind of see them in, in your mind kind of hee-hawing around with each other. And finally they just turned and said, no, Lord, we never lacked anything. And that's the way God is. That's the way God is. We were having a discussion at the Bible study at the prison about the judgment seat of Christ. And I don't, I'm not, don't have time to get into that right now. But one thing I want you to remember, you are going to give an account, and I'm going to give an account. And that account that we're going to give, the judgment at the Bema seat of Christ, has nothing to do with salvation. If you weren't saved, you wouldn't be there. It's for the righteous. But we will be judged on what we did with what he gave us. Remember the parable of the talents? To this servant was given so many talents, to this one was so many talents, to this one was so many talents. Then when the, when, the, when the owner came back, he said, what have you done? He never asked them to give an account of anything in their life except for what he had given them. You will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says every one of us is going to stand there. And what we're going to give an account for is what did we do with the gifts he gave us. It's an important time. It'll help determine what our positions are going to be in the, in the millennial kingdom. We've got a thousand years of serving ahead of us. It's all about purpose. It's all about heart. It's all about loving people. It's all giving in the way God would give, loving in the way God would love. Father, we thank you that you ask nothing of us in return but what you have already given us. Lord, is there anything in our lives that we have that didn't come from you? Not one thing. If you do talk about a tithe, Lord God, my goodness, the rest of that 90% is yours too. Everything is yours. I think we, 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 we have a problem when we think that this is reserved for God and this is reserved for me. It's all God's. We know that. We just need to be reminded of it at times. So, Lord, thank you that you want us to be a people of good works that bring you glory, working from our salvation, not towards it, and knowing that you have already made arrangements for us to be blessed and to bless others. And we're so grateful for your love. Father, let each of us leave here today without forgetting what we have learned about our body being the temple of the living God who walks in our midst, who walks in the very heart of our spirit and we will see him face to face in that day Lord thank you for everything, for your love for your blessings for all that you are and all that you do above all the gift of your son and your righteous spirit that makes him real to all of us bless this day to your glory thank you for our church family thank you for the love that takes us all the way in Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, beloved. Janet, we will miss you. You leaving this week? Okay. Well, God bless you.